Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. In the studio with us today is artist Faith Porter. You're going to see her work on the set, and you're going to be very excited about it. But before we talk to Faith, we went on location to talk to actor Greg Marks. Greg is best known to TV audiences as Tom Hughes on the CBS daytime drama As the World Turns and a role for which he received an Emmy Award as Best Supporting Actor. Besides As the World Turns, he also starred uh, for three years in NBC's Days of Our Lives and a lot of other TV shows. So watch him in this clip and you'll recognize him as he plays a lawyer. How did you know that Douglas Cummings was responsible for those three murders? He admitted it to me. And you never suspected it before then? I suspected. I had no proof. Well, that's odd. Uh, Dr. Strauss's picture appeared in every periodical, magazine, newspaper across the country when they were trying to identify him. Did you never see that? Yes. But you chose not to come forward and identify him. Well, I, I wanted to, but... But what, Miss Talbot? But you were afraid of antagonizing Mr. Cummings? This paragon of kindness, Objection. this wonderful Please man who you had this affection this for. Sustain. Thank you. Miss Talbot, it was you that asked Dr. Strauss to come to Oakdale to help Douglas Cummings, was it not? Yes. Why? Why did you feel that he needed help? I was beginning to suspect that he might have something to do with those deaths you've just mentioned. I see. Is it not true that your cousin Elaine Hargrove Hi, was Greg. engaged? Hi. Did you enjoy playing a lawyer in that role? I loved it, actually. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. I actually had planned to be a lawyer. Oh, really? Before I became an actor. So you spent time in school? I did. Somewhere. Lots of time in school. <laughs> Where? At UCLA. Oh, so are you a native California? I am. Born and raised. Oh, great. Yeah. So what happened to your legal uh, life? My, my real legal life or my, my soap opera legal life? Your real legal my life. My real legal life, I realized I was far more interested in playing a lawyer than being a lawyer. And uh, I really didn't want to deal with, uh, I'm fascinated by the law, but I didn't want to spend my life doing it. Well, then how'd you so, get into acting? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, it, it sort of was something I kind of fell into and started to love and continued to do it for a while. Did you take acting classes at UCLA? Not at UCLA because I was pre-law, but I actually started taking a lot of classes afterwards. As I, as I started realizing I wanted to be a performer, then I started taking classes. With different people in LA? Yes, or? yes. Well, that probably accounts for all the stage work you did. Because I think you've, you've really done a lot of work on stage, uh, more that I was surprised. Uh, and usually when you're act, taking acting lessons here, you're spending time on the stage with right. your teacher. Right. And I had a wonderful, I had a lot of wonderful teachers, but uh, one man in particular, a guy named Daryl Hickman. Oh, um, I, yeah. Do you know Daryl? Well, I know him you know just from who, he, from is? <laughs> who sure. he is. And he's a wonderful, wonderful teacher. Well, is that a reason that he was very active in uh, TV? Did that guide you toward a TV career? No. Um, like a lot of things in life, there's sort of a synchronicity going on, and it just kind of happened. Um, this was an audition. The first thing I did was Days of Our Lives, and that came up, and I went on the audition, and I got the job, and spent three years there. So that's that's how it happened. Just well, yeah, it was just like just like that. <laughs> an overnight I mean, success. That's what I right, after ten right, years, right? right exactly. An overnight ten year yeah. success. But I have to say, it happened for me more quickly than than for a lot of people that I know, and and for that I was very grateful. But it. It took a number of auditions before that happened. When you're doing daytime, can you do anything else? It's tough. 
A, a lot <laughs> of a lot of uh, actors in New York though do daytime shows during the day and then they do uh, theater at night. Have you which done is that tough. here? No, no. Uh, that's a that's a tough one. When you're sitting, obviously you come prepared. You're on the set one all hopes. day. <laughs> well, you're on the set all day too. Right. There must be a lot of dead time. Yeah. And that's when you were creating other projects. Right. Um, it, it, you really do have a, there's a lot of waiting around. <laughs> there's a lot of waiting around and that's plenty of time for ideas to sort of s kind of pop into your head and that's where the idea for the My Romance series came up. Tell me about the My Romance because uh, I think it's really interesting that someone would be rushing to the set and coming back and thinking about doing something else. Uh, attached to drama really yeah well, I think everybody's always looking for other outlets you know new things to do different challenges and um, I have to say that the idea for the series kind of sprang into my head it wasn't it, it wasn't something I sort of de it, it developed after that but and mm -hmm. it sort of has evolved but it really was an idea that just came to me kind of I thought well I knew the power of the daytime medium and uh, and I was looking I wanted to put uh, daytime actors on audio tape <coughs> and started out with the idea of doing children's books which uh, sort of fairy tales for children sort of has evolved over the last year or two into fairy tales for adults so we're, we're doing romance which is a really good connection because so tell exactly it's an audio book it's audio romances read by the stars uh, actually perform more than just read by the stars of daytime by daytime couples is that right yeah yeah and, and how do you get them to come aboard I'm dying to come aboard. Well, there's a couple of things. One is I have a lot of friends in daytime because of my time there. But also, uh, you know, any actor that I know of, and certainly my, it was true of, of me as an actor, is always interested in doing something else. To explore something different and try something else. Because one of the wonderful things about daytime is you have a regular job as an actor. Mm -hmm. But it also means you're kind of doing the same thing over and over again. And so it's nice to try something a little different. I was talking to... Um librarian from Beverly Hills yesterday and he said one of the biggest things in the library are these audio books big and people take I mean take the classics on trips with them right. and car in the car all the time and he said that like one person would read but read with all these different voices right. and make this drama so interesting and you don't do that. You bring actually all the voices into it. Well, I initially we did our first uh, one with one actress, and uh, I and she was doing oh, all the, the voices, all the and she did a wonderful job. But we decided to that it was important to have the interplay of the male and female voices, and uh, it gives it an extra sort of layer of drama, which uh, serves the project really well. And so we're going to be doing, and it also uh, enables us to play off because what we're doing is, for example, uh, Wally Kurth and Rena Sofer from General Hospital did our latest one, Enchantment, which it? is right here, and that's your own personal copy. Oh, that's for you. Oh, thank you. I'm going to listen and, uh, to it on the way home Good. Today. you got to tell me what you think. But what it is, is just uh, two tapes. Right. Stick it in your car or in when you're jogging or anywhere. On a plane, by a <laughs> pool. And is it... Uh, um, Something that you wrote? No, these are these are actual romance novels that have been published, and uh, we acquire the rights to them and then uh, dramatize them on audio. I see. Where do you do this? You don't do it actually on the set, do you? No, we, <laughs> no, no. We go to a studio, a recording studio. And Does it take a lot of time? It takes about eight to ten hours. Ah, oh, so. You know, so. and w when you're working with daytime performers, they're really quick. You have to be in daytime, and so they can pick up material and be pretty, pretty facile with it. Pretty, pretty the fast. The other thing, the other thing that you've done so much of is voiceover and right. commercials and advertising. Is that really go along with the, with the? Uh, TV stuff, TV work? Well, as an actor, you kind of, you go in a lot of different directions. You do a lot of different things. And uh, one wonderful thing for me about the voiceover work is that it enabled me to step back from the acting, the on-camera acting, and create this. So it was a great opportunity. Have you done uh, film work? Actually, no. That is so amazing that you could be doing so many things on TV. I mean, working every day for so many years also doing series, right? You did mm -hmm. a lot of uh, work on series, different right. series. 
And you never did a film? No. Is that next? That probably would have been the next thing. I'm, I'm taking a hiatus from acting right now. Uh, I'm really busy with <laughs> this. Are you an this. entrepreneur now? You're yeah, not I, an it actor? seems to be. I'm playing an entrepreneur. I play an <laughs> entrepreneur on TV. But uh, yeah, that's kind of the next phase, and then we'll see what happens. That's great. Well, lots of luck. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad that, that I caught you today so we could talk about it. And let me know what you think. I want to I get will. your critique. I all right? will. I okay. will. We'll be right back. Bye. <laughs>
And but did they um, really see what you were doing? Because their forms were, I mean, their work was pure form. Well, yes, they did. Because you see, Susan was also very academic. She was brilliant in the physics of glaze technology. Ah, I see. And she wrote books and taught classes on it. She also has written some of the most well-known books on the art treasures of worlds, like Shoji Hamada from Japan, oh, Bernard see. Leach of England, Maria Martinez of San Ildefonso. So she's an academic who did pots. But did you need the glaze part of what she knew? Yes. Was that in important order, to yes. your project? In order to create what would uh, the glaze that went on the porcelain, I needed to know how to calculate these equations, um. which for a girl who never liked chemistry in high school, that was certainly, it had a more pertinent reason to know it so you can, en you can enjoy more when you're doing it for a reason. And Carlton, of course, was the master of forms. And, uh, but then there were other, all the professors were like a family that nurtured the students. Well, the other, the other professor, and I, I knew him from art school, was Keith Crown, yes. who was a genius in yes. watercolor. And color and light. And color. But you see, his medium in watercolor is really about light. It's how the light refracts through the painting, and his subjects are always about light. So, in, I, for me, what I have found in my journey is it isn't what you do, it's how you do it that really makes your mark or makes helps you teach the world what your visions are. And I think artists come to the planet to show people a new way of seeing, no matter what the medium is. I mean, I think that the people in the computer world now are artists. If you're going to talk about creativity, it's how you do what you do. But so, then, so that takes us a step further. We see your background, we see color, we see right. pottery, we see porcelain, which is like the finest, yes, right? And the finest, light going through. And the light yes. going through. And your academic, uh, portion right. of your background. Right. Now we've gotten into designing of what we see on the set and what's on you and what's on me. Um, jewels. Which is really light again. It's about light. I use crystal a great deal as a base for my designs, but that isn't because it's crystal. I use it because it's a form of light. It can create windows and spaces in the designs that emit the light, which I find that light elevates your spirit. I find that no matter if you're a man or a woman, it's about an energy that gives you energy yourself. But isn't so, that what they say when you bring crystals in to, into sure, your house? Surely. It's, it's bringing different lights yes. into your being? And, and, it's, and a lot of my pieces you don't really need to wear. They have to do with adornment to make it personal to your body, to your energy field. But they really, many of them should be put in lucite cases on a coffee table for the enjoyment as an amulet or a fetish. But the other thing is um, you say it's not about glitz and yet crystal and everything that you have here is pretty glitzy. Well, this is pretty glitzy But stuff. see, I want to clarify that word. For me, the word glitz, and particularly how it was coined in the 80s off a lot of really badly done things, glitz for me means something done in bad taste. Someone who puts <laughs> himself together and it isn't quite right, it's not chic, it's just overdone, whatever. And the same with when you create forms with light. In the jewelry world, particularly in the costume world, it can be really glitzy if it's not well designed and when you don't know when to stop. Now, with my work, I find that this is not about glitz, it's about light again. Mm -hmm. And if you separate each of these pieces alone, they're busy when they're together, but when you look at just one by itself, it's a repeating of a pattern over and over of the same thing, so it's very pure. So it isn't overdone. The piece in the front oh, with the square this. blocks shows you how you can have a small collar like this, um, or you can have one strand of this, or you can have this in, in, in with semi-precious stones between it, or you can layer these like this, or you can hook them together. So we do a lot of things where there are multiples that create many different looks or extensions or emotions. And it's really about emotion, too. Well, what about um, comparing crystals to diamonds? I mean, we're talking about wearing jewelry now. Right. And we're talking about wearing crystal. Right. I mean, Swarovski, right. Swarovski well, makes Swarovski crystal. Well, Swarovski is the only company in the world that creates lead crystal components that you can actually work into other things. Could you, would you work with their crystal? No, it's the only crystal I do work with. There is oh, no other. You do? There oh, is I no see. other. And they have a monopoly on the planet. They I have see. created fabulous little pieces that you can buy and string them. But I use them again as a window, as a, a space for light. Like in this butterfly, wherever you see clear, it's because the window of light has been created by the Swarovski, because I can buy the same millimeter over and over and I can create a matrix. 
and the sterling oh. silver butterfly is all war woven from sterling. This is sterling silver. Sterling on silver this and, piece. and light. And, and then you also talk about gold filled balls. What are yes, gold Yes, now on this balls? piece, this piece is solid garnet, sterling, and gold filled. And this can be a belt, it can come apart and be two necklaces, it can be just lay on the table as a chain, paper chain like at Christmas. But, but does but it have to be hollow? Is that why yes. they're gold filled? No, they're gold filled because solid gold costs so much more, it prohibits the people that I want to enjoy it. And it doesn't look any different than the gold filled. So this is real gold, but it's not the same amount of gold. And real garnet beads. Yes, and real sterling and real crystal. And it's not dipped gold, it's real gold in made into the bead. So it's a level that I have taken it uh, above costume but below diamonds and gold so that more people I mean this but do you people, like diamonds I I think they're lovely but I I am more interested in the light and the esoteric feeling one gets from an art piece than what you can get from diamonds because diamonds, diamonds are limiting you can only do so much with diamonds but wouldn't they reflect also the same kind of Th they light do, you're but talking about you have to always bezel a diamond in a little prong mm. to oh, or, or to get it saying. so you're constricted or restricted or you wouldn't be stringing, down, you no. wouldn't be stringing no. diamond beads. And because you can string the lights, you can, you can open like these blocks, these square blocks, you can do a whole wall of them. And I'm really not interested in women wearing my jewelry to show how much their husband is worth. I'm interested in their wear, wearing it to show that they are interested in art pieces that bring them to a feeling of, of excitement or takes them to a place about themselves they don't know they have because it's really about discovering yourself more than how much money are you worth. But, but That's I, I remember early on, because I always look at dresses as an art form right. or something like that, and with Zandra Rhodes' clothes, yes. who yes. she designs the fabric and she right. designs the artwork, and I used to hang them in my bedroom because as to art, me exactly. they were pieces of art. That yeah, was yes. as close to and a I painting. And I have a scarf of Zandra's on the wall. As a piece of art, a, yes, same, exactly. You're talking about the exactly. same kind of situation. And I here. have a lot of clients, even men clients, who own major pieces, like say they own this butterfly, and they would hang it on the wall in a frame and you don't ever wear it. It's just a butterfly, or I it's see. a dragon, or it's a... Now, not only do I do these major pieces that can be pure art, as I say, this, this paper chain never has to be worn at all. It can just lay on a table. I do small things. This is, this is more what women are wearing now. It's small, it's not overbearing. Um, here's a tiny little black um, dog collar. These are things for me that are lovely necklaces. But these but are pieces still of art. Radiating. Well, that's because they're are made they out, still of, radiating being out of the crystal. They're but if but if you look at this piece, this is all mother of pearl. Well that's what I was gonna say. One you of know, the things, and it lights. One of the things that you use um, that I, I read and I, I don't I'm going to have you explain it as using vintage pieces yes in your work yes um, these pieces I have and in, in this collection in this wrap these are all Ethiopian silver pieces which are very very hard to find oh, so now they're old pieces this is all old Ethiopian silver oh, married together with Swarovski crystal sterling silver and frosted beads I and see. then this piece is a pendant that goes off and on to give it a, a, a V shape but I you see. can take this off and wear it three ways I see. And, and, and for instance, these pieces are just simple, um, long pieces of on sterling, but all the pieces are vintage. They are old pieces. Old pieces. So when I find more than, well, I buy them if there's only one and keep them, but if I find five or ten, then I can make five or ten and sell I them see. See. or let other people enjoy them. That's the thing about w when you're designing for stores, you do need to sometimes be able to do more than one. We... we um are getting close to the end of our time, but I wanted you to take me quickly through the 60s, what you did then. Okay, in the 60s I was doing a lot of painting. I was also a painter and I was doing my porcelain and my ceramics because I, from 60 to 66 I was doing my thesis and my bachelor's degree. I see. And then after I left USC I spent four or five years actually producing porcelains that were in exhibits in museums and That's which are owned by collectors. Um, and then, then into the 70s. And then in the 70s, my husband was working with Frank Gehry as his right arm, not knowing that Frank would turn out to be Frank Gehry. And um, so we were then building a house in the Brentwood Hills, which has become a show uh, place in that it's been published many times because my husband is a wonderful architect, but he does commercial architecture now and builds all over the world. 
And so at that time, I was having to move. So it's hard to replay, put your 4,000 pound kill in a studio in a new house. Oh, I then I was doing wearable art. Then I was making large pieces. And this is actually what happened. The first piece, who do I show this Shout to? Shout to her. The first piece, <laughs> this was uh, on the, the But this was in the 80s? Said, this was, no. Are we to the 80s yet? No, this is in the 70s. Still in the 70s. And this 70s. was in 76, and this was a forerunner of all the things I started doing in wearable art. And so I really was kind of in the beginning of that movement. But then these things got smaller, and then I started doing things for stores. And this is Cindy Crawford, before she was the famous Cindy Crawford, in an iMagnon ad wearing a crystal bib that I did for a Magnon uh, store. And so, so take me to the so, 80s. So this was the 70s, and then in the 80s, my children needed to go to private school, and so I started this as a jewelry business and uh, sold to, okay. to Neiman's and I Magnus for the, for 15 to 20 years now okay. to put them through school. Okay. So they got it. smaller actually from the big wearable art pieces in museums. I see. Then so, now going into the millennium and into the 2000 and being right. in 2000, what will we do? What well, will what we I'm, see? What I'm hoping to do is to expand these things that actually went from the um, macrocosm to the microcosm and now I'd like to go back to the macrocosm that's and right. I'd like these to become walls. That's what I so thought. You want something big. Well, I, I really am not a jeweler. I'm an artist and I visualize these walls of light to transmit people's emotions even further than these collars. And okay, things. one other question before we have to leave. I know you're married to James Porter, an architect, yes. and I know he was with Frank at one time. Yes. And he was with uh, Ron Altoon. Well, he, they're he, partners. He's uh, partners Ron with Altoon Ron Altoon. Altoon. And, yes, and they have Altoon and Porter Architects and they build all over the world. And they actually saved Bullock's Wilshire for us. And Ron Porter, I mean, not Ron Porter, Ron Altoon yes. was the um, president of the AIA. Last year, right. Last year. Exactly. And how does an architect handle this feeling of light? How did the two of you work well, together? Well, actually, the house that we designed together in 19, um, whatever it was, 76, is 40% glass. So it's a fabulous four-story house of light on the hills. And it is perfect for my work. So I use it as a showroom and studio because I live in a four-acre canyon of paradise. And I've planted every tree and built every, I did it all. And, and so I love it there. And so you did it all today, too. Well, I don't know. I didn't do it all today. <laughs> Thanks for being <laughs> thank with you, us. Joan. Thank you, Joan. Thank you uh, to Faith. Thank and you. thank you to, for watching. And keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor. Los Angeles, you'll see it at the end of the roll. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.